There we go. There we go. So the thing that I forgot to do today was to ask Tom for a bio, which I am sure if I committed it to memory, it would be very, very long. Um, he has been doing amazing things in this region uh, in, in archeology span uh, with the Department of Historic Resources for quite some time, I think right now. So if Tom, if you can fill in the, fill in the gaps, um, about your background, um, we, are, we are so lucky to have you tonight and, and I want everybody to know your, your credentials. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my very first Zoom meeting, so I hope it turns out well. Um, let's see, I got into archeology span mostly because of a teacher I had in high school and he really brought history to life by bringing in lots of artifacts and it really helped me understand history a lot much more clear uh, so when i went to college i uh, really wasn't sure what i wanted to do but i did take a class in an intro to archaeology and i really enjoyed the class a lot so i decided i would try to make a career out of it i received my bachelor's degree from indiana university of pennsylvania and then i worked in the field of archaeology moving around the east and Midwest part of the country for a few years. Then I hooked up with the University of Delaware and worked there. And that's when my boss encouraged me to go to graduate school. So I went to graduate school at UVA, got my graduate degree there. And the first job notice that I saw, I applied for the job and I ended up in the Roanoke Valley. That was in 1989. And I've been here ever since. Wow, that is fantastic. We, we got lucky. <laughs> oh, we, I got we, lucky. Turned out to be a great place to come to. to, come to. Well, good. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, with Fran, great one, gratitude. One more okay. comment. One more comment, Fran. I went down on, on, the, on my computer on that bottom bar that has, you know, what you can have, what you can't have. Now mine has, happens to have a sound, low, uh, sound. Okay, Sharon, can you, can you hear us? It looks like a speaker with three bars. Do you have that on the bottom of your computer screen? No. Your computer, not his presentation. No, okay, are you, are you having trouble with your audio, Sharon? No, that's how I set mine up to be louder. Oh, okay. I went down, right. what is that called? A control bar, it says on the really bottom, AOL, Word, blah, 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 on my computer. So I'm okay. Just, okay, well, I think, I, I think we're, we're okay now, Sharon. So okay. we'll, we'll turn it over to Tom and let him, let him yeah, uh, do his I'm presentation. Gonna okay, I'm gonna get my presentation running here very quickly and we'll get on the road. So, like I said, it's a pleasure to be here. Today was a very important day in our local and regional history because it was on this day, 350 years ago, that Thomas Batts, Robert Fallum, and their Indian guides descended the valley and entered into Totera town, the town of the Totera Indians. There, we know this because Robert Fallon kept the daily journal and his daily journal is like the journals, the written accounts of most of the early explorers. They are both as fascinating as they are frustrating. And many people have read these journals through the years. And the main attempt is to try to determine where Bats and Fallon were, where, where they went, what they found. The thing is trying to place all of this on the map. And it's always been really frustrating for people. I don't know how many of you may have noticed John Long's article in the Roanoke Times last month. It was August 19th. He wrote a column that he called Heroes or Vanguards of Savage Conquest. And in his column, he, he you know, brought up remembrance of Batson Fallum and said that 
you know, this is, these are people we need to think about. We need to remember these people and their impact on our local and regional history. So I want to do the same thing tonight. I will be bringing up Bats and Fallum, but I really want to focus on some of the people Bats and Fallum encountered during their expedition, and that would be the Native Americans. So like I said, many people have read the account written by Robert Fallum, and one of the most recognized and older accepted routes of Bats and Fallum is this little black dotted route that leads from Fort Henry in the east. Fort Henry was located pretty close to present day um, Petersburg, Virginia. And they traveled westward to find the Western waters. That is a quick route to the lucrative trade mar markets in Japan and China. So this exploration was not geared to finding out about the physical environment or the social environment. It was really to find a quick trade route. This was pure economics in, in action. So that's in Falum. They traveled westward. And we have to understand when they traveled westward, neither of those these men had any idea really where they were going or what they were going to encounter. They had some intelligence from previous encounters, but really they had no idea where they were going, how they were going to get there, or really if their objective was something that existed. Were, were they ac actually going to be able to fulfill their mission of heading westward to find the western waters? So here's another map. And the, the route of Bats and Fallon there is marked in, in, in dark red. There's an alternative route. Many people have alternative routes. This route it marked in yellow is likely the route reconstructed by the historian Alan Bryceland. And he has a very different interpretation. While most people in the Bats and Fallon expedition near the present day city of Radford uh, at the New River, he projected Totera Town to be located in Western or in West Virginia, and the Western Waters, where they stopped, was not the New River, but it was the Tug Fork of the Big Sandy River. Um, different interpretations. Other people have made the same interpretations. Numerous people have. Uh, we're sort of lucky today because we have a good set of archaeological data that can be evaluated in the context of the Batson Fallum Journal to get a better idea. At least we have some archaeological sites that date to the 17th century, and we can try to position those on these projected routes of Bats and Fallum. So we're in a much better position now than people even 50 years ago or 25 years ago. Another interesting thing about the Bats and Fallum is that you can read their journal to look at the physical environment. They have very little description of the physical environment. That one thing that's quite noticeable is with all the rivers they encountered, those rivers were already named, presumably by fur traders. So when Bats and Fallum entered into a valley and came across Totera Town, they said it was on the banks of the Roanoke River. So that's interesting. Another way of looking at this whole journal is this idea, as I mentioned before, Bats and Fallon probably didn't really know where they were going or how they were gonna get there. They relied on a group of guides who were Native Americans. These guides very, very likely had an, a good idea where they were going, probably had traveled this route before. And so one must wonder how much control did those guys, guides exert on the travel route of Bats and Fallum. I think if they left Fort Henry and traveled westward, if they planned it out, they probably could have arrived at a native town on each and every day where they could have rested their horses and rested their bodies 
had dinner, some drink, and actually met with many of the Native Americans. But that didn't really happen. Instead, they during their travel westward, they only stop at a few different native towns. One of the things interesting about that is whenever they did stop at a native town, the Indians were already expecting them. They know they knew that Bats and Fallon were en route and that they were going to be stopping. So they were prepared for them. The, the word traveled quickly about this. So I think the Native Americans out this way, when they encountered Bats and Fallon, they expected all of this, whereas Bats and Fallon were really up to the advice and the guidance and the words of their, of their guides, their Indian guides. So interesting way of looking at, at, the, at their travels. I'm going to use a, a quite a bit of Bats and Fallon's description, and I hope that the text is not too much. I'll just try to sort of uh, give you a summary of some of the statements. But when I do this presentation, what I would like to really do is first introduce you to one site in Salem that I believe is Totera Town. I've never been shy in, rec in, in saying that. And I really believe that the site in Salem located at the James Moyer Sports Complex is our best available evidence for Totera Town. The interesting thing about the Roanoke Valley is that we have a group of archeological sites that have been investigated that date to the 1700s. These stretch from the eastern part of the city of Roanoke where the 13th Street Bridge crosses the Roanoke River all the way into Salem and almost to West Salem, pretty close to where Mill Creek Lane crosses the Roanoke River. These sites have been investigated. They have trade goods. We have radiocarbon dates that put them in that date these sites into the 17th century. And the Graham White site, it take, that site takes its name from its previous landowner, the Graham White Foundry. That site located uh, where, the, where the James Moyer Sports Complex is located has the greatest number and diversity of trade artifacts. And it has radiocarbon dates that put it right into that 17 or 1650 to 1675 time bracket, which corresponds to the exploration of Bats and Fallum. So here we have the words of Robert Fallum written today, 350 years ago. And he says they found this lovely valley about six miles over with curious bumps and risings. That does sound a lot like the Roanoke Valley, but as John Long has, has said, you know, these descriptions can fit many valleys in the area. A bump is a little round hill, sort of like round hill uh, in, in Roanoke Valley, north of the city of Roanoke. Risings are bold springs emanating from the ground. They, they crossed over this valley, came down uh, a steep incline, and there they came to Totera Town, where they were civilly treated for a number of days. They actually stayed there for like three or four days. So these were the first Euro-American colonists to visit Totero Town. My guess is that the Totero Indians had met whites before, probably some fur traders in the area. So here's some sites from the, here's some pictures from the archeological site. And this archeologist is excavating what we call a subsurface feature. Basically, these were pits that were dug in the ground by the Native Americans and then filled in with a lot of materials, usually a lot of organic material. Therefore, the fill of the dirt has this dark humic look to it. But we excavate that soil out. And when we were excavating, we were under a lot of time constraints because the sports complex was under construction. So we excavated soil, removed it from the site, and then processed the soil at a later time and at another place. All the work was fully documented and the excavators probably spent 
not as much time excavating as they did documenting, but they did spend a lot of time documenting, not only with scale drawings, but their written words of what they encountered during the excavation. That information becomes just as important for, as the artifacts itself for interpreting the site. But right away, we found a lot of artifacts that were typical of the traditional material culture of the Native Americans out this way. Here we see some uh, smoking pipes for tobacco. We see a lot of pottery. We see an, uh, one archaeologist excavating a large piece of a broken pot. In the lower right-hand corner is a reconstructed jar or small uh, pottery vessel. Gives you a good idea of the shape and look of these, of these materials. But we also found a lot of other materials that were interesting. Uh, in the upper left are marginella shell beads. These are marginella shells <clears throat> that come from the, the Atlantic Ocean. And marginella have a natural range that extends from about Virginia Beach all the way down through South Florida. These shells were collected and then they were rubbed up against a rock and to the upper end of the whorl opened up and then they were used to string onto clothing and they were often used in mortuary context and they were strung onto burial shrouds. So these materials were, are very indicative of the trade connections between Native Americans from the coastline all the way to the inland. So these materials were collected along the coast, processed, and then traded inward to other groups. And in the lower left-hand side, we have small beads made of both shell, marine shell and bone. And these were also involved in the trade system. But some other shell beads we encountered were very unexpected. And these are the ones depicted on the right-hand side. These are what are referred to as uh, conical beads. They are cylindrical and they have a hole drilled through them. When, when the Europeans first colonized Northeast United States, they encountered Native Americans who were using these beads and they really prized these beads. They used them a lot for wampum belts, the Iroquois did. And so the, the, the colonists, and they were very industrial, they realized that these this, these beads represented the commodity that the Indians desired. Um, they have the, the lavender and white color from the shell of a quahog clam, uh, which are from the Atlantic coast. So the, many of the Euro, European colonists began, began making their own beads for trade to the Indians. The beads we found at at the James Moyer Sports Complex, upon close examination, the bore that was drilled through the beads was a straight bore made with metal drill bits. So these were produced by Europeans, probably in the Virginia colony, and they were intended for the Indian trade. So these materials perhaps made around the Williamsburg area or around, you know, probably around Williamsburg, were then traded inland and ended up in Salem. Other artifacts that we found, uh, again, we see on the left side more the shell and bone, small beads. There are also some glass beads. On the right-hand side, that sort of gives you an illustration, an idea of the range and types of glass beads that we found that were trade beads. The two beads on the lower row in the center, um, they have redwood exteriors. One had a translucent green interior, the other a translucent blue interior. These are referred to as cornerline de Aleppo beads. These beads have been found in 17th century context in other Native American sites in the southeastern United States. And these almost always date to that 1650, the 17 time period. So again, these beads, these beads really intersect the same time period of the Batson Fallum expedition. So we're really get, gathering some really good evidence to suggest that 
the, the site at the James Moyer Sports Complex was Toterra Town. <clears throat> Other materials are scraps of metal that were probably the accoutrements of shoulder arms or side arms that were no longer functioning. So the Indians would dismantle them and then use the scraps of metal to form decorative objects or decorative items that they could hang on their clothing. Uh, in the upper right hand side are two pieces of carved antler. These actually can join to form a ferrule um, that was the centerpiece connecting the metal part of a table knife to a bone or wood handle. Again, very interesting trade items. And then probably the, the trade item that captures most people's attention is this trigger. And this is a view of a trigger prior to conservation. Here's a view of it after conservation. And its form and size are indicative of a Snoppin's shoulder arm. Snoppin's shoulder arms were very popular uh, weapons, but by 1650, they had been superseded by the matchlock. So the, the, shop, the Snoppin's rifles were usually sold or traded to smaller countries, or they were put into the Indian trade market. These guns, like the matchlocks, are notorious because they are extremely inaccurate. They make a loud noise and they emit a very deadly projectile. But basically all you could do with these shoulder arms is point them in a direction, pull the trigger and hope that bullet went somewhere where you intended it to go, but usually it didn't. So the Native Americans really did not want, they prized these the, they prized the possession of these shoulder arms, but they really didn't use them as hunting weapons. Instead, they relied on their long bows, which were much more quiet. They don't scare the game, and they were much more accurate, especially in a virgin forest where there's not a dense understory. Instead, they used these rifles usually to create loud noises to drive game in certain directions where other hunters would be awaiting those, the game so they could harvest them for large feast. Or they would use these weapons as a form of communication. They would fire the weapons to welcome people into villages or to communicate with other people at a distance, much like they would use drums. Now, the material evidence we uncovered at the, at the site at the James Moyer Sports Complex indicated that the people there, um, there were actually two occupations of that site. One occurred in the 1400s, and then the site was abandoned for a while, which is pretty typical. And then the site was reoccupied in the 1600s. But the material culture suggests that the people living in that village were in contact with the Europeans maybe bats and phallum, probably bats and phallum, and probably also other fur traders. Um, that, but the Native Americans still were practicing a tr very traditional lifestyle, indicating at this early time period, 1650 to 1675, their traditional life ways had not really changed much, but things were going to change quite rapidly. Goodness. Tom, I would just like to point out while you have the, the, the trigger up, um, that trigger is on display at the Salem Museum, as are a number of these other artifacts um, that I expect you provided for us, but uh, would invite people to come see. Yeah, the, the, what happens is uh, the artifacts really belong to whoever owns the property. So the artifacts fell into the possession of the owners of the property, which was the city of Salem. And then we curated the artifacts and processed the artifacts and curated them, held onto them for a number of years until the Salem Historical Society made a request to the city of Salem for transfer of the artifacts. And the city granted that transfer. That transfer. So the artifacts were then moved from 
the office of the Department of Historic Resources here, which, well, at the time we were in Roanoke, and that was transferred to your mu museum in Salem. Many, many thanks. Yeah, well, thank, say thanks to the city of Salem. I'm just glad all of the artifacts stayed in the city of Salem and didn't go someplace else. So to look at things, we have to sort of look at some of the other expeditions that occurred here. Bats and Fallon were not the first, but they were the first to enter into the Western part of the state. At unknown times, a number of fur traders were commissioned to enter into the inland part of Virginia to trade with Native Americans and to start making contact with Native Americans in order to collect furs that would then be traded into the skin market in Europe. There was a great demand for animal skins that would be converted into fashionable clothing. So very wealthy people were commissioning fur traders to go inland, make some contact with Native Americans and establish a trading relationship. These fur traders brought back some information on groups of Native Americans and towns and things like that, but not really a lot. The first documented uh, exploration of, was in 1650, that was Edward Bland. That was followed by sh two short explorations by John Lederer, those were back to back, then Bats and Fallon uh, and Thomas Woods was in there. Needham and Arthur really left Fort Henry or Petersburg, Virginia and went southward, uh, never really came close to this area. One of the best written accounts of early exploration into Central Virginia and our region and into North Carolina was written by John Lawson. And that's based on his 1700 uh, explorations. It's a very detailed and lengthy um, account. So it provides a lot of great information, but it was written in 1700. It's interesting to read John Lawson's account and see what happened to the bats and Fallon between 1671 and 1700, just a period of 29 years a tremendous amount did occur. When we wanna study the Native Americans in this area, it's really, really frustrating because our early maps are like these ones. The one on the left, you look at Western Virginia and it says the Tuscaroras were living here. The one on the right-hand side suggests that our region was part of the Iroquois um, territory. Both of these are extremely inaccurate and the map makers had the available information at hand, but they chose not to use it. Why they were producing these maps, I don't know, but this is the type of material that caused a lot of confusion for many, many decades. I remember when I was a young student of archeology, span I saved my money and I was so excited to purchase the volume 15 of the Smithsonian Institution's Handbook of Native Americans. And it was for the Northeast. And I opened it up and I saw this map you see on the left-hand side. And I was so disappointed that here in Virginia, most of the map is completely unlabeled. A small part near the border of, of West Virginia and Kentucky just says poorly known tribes of the interior. That was really disappointing. By the time volume 14 came out in 2004, things were better, but not too much better. I like the fact that it does say Totero and neighboring groups, um, and it shows the territory extending into West Virginia, but that territory is really much too small and neighboring groups, well, we knew who those groups were, so why not list them? In North Carolina, it says Catawba and neighboring groups, where that, that was actually many of the Siouan speaking groups who were very closely related to the Indians in our region. So uh, I was really disappointed in things like that. This is a more modern abstract map, but 
uh, I like it because for our area, it's much more accurate. That area in the light brown color is fairly accurate. It could be expanded, uh, it should be expanded, but here it does contain the names of many of the tribal groups. There were probably other tribal groups whose names have escaped history, but it does have the Manahoic, the Monacan, the Okanichi, Saponi, and Tutelo, and in parentheses under that Totero. I would extend that Totero territory what northwest into, uh, into uh, West Virginia. Um, and I could probably put together another presentation to critically evaluate that, that lavender area listed as shifting tribal groups. That's not really right. And the area in green listed as Cherokee is a bit misleading, uh, but I like the area marked in brown with our area. So some of this information is getting better through time. Now I want to trace the history of the Totero people from the first encounter with the European explorers, that's Bats and Fallum, 1671, and we'll carry that history up to the late 1800s. It's not a very detailed history because much of what happened to these people, much of their history was never documented. But it is interesting to see what happened to these people right after 1671. Uh, the other groups had very similar histories. One thing you can count on with all of the groups uh, in the Central Virginia area, they were interrelated both politically and socially. So they had a shared history, but each tribal group had its own particular unique history. So there were multiple histories of all of these people. So to get on to the Totero history, early on, 1671, the Totero, in our best reconstruction of their territory, they occupied lands in the Roanoke Valley westward to the New River Valley. Uh, this was where Bats and Fallum and her native guides met the Totero. Much change did follow during that time period. Material culture from a lot of archaeological sites is the evidence we use to create this territory. So the, the material culture we see associated with the trade artifacts is the same material culture that extends back to the 1500s and even into the 1400s, which suggests a very long continuity of life of the Totero Indians in this part of Virginia. Uh, I really like this quote by John Lawson. John Lawson never, at this, he was not in the region in 1671, uh, his quotes from 1700, but it's an interesting quote because the early explorers and even the fur traders they were quite taken with the physical stature, the physical appearance of the Native Americans. So he says they were tall, likely men, you know, with strong food that makes strong, robust bodies. These guys were really impressed by the size and stature of the Native Americans. And this is something that a description that reoccurs through many different accounts by different explorers. So here we are in 1671, and we have to sort of get ready for some changes. There are some clues of these changes in the journals of Bats and Fallum. Here are three entries, uh, and these are really important entries because they act, they give a sign of the change that was about to, con to come about. On September 6th, as the exploration was moving westward, Mr. Thomas Woods, who I've not mentioned before, he was one of the three leaders of the expedition. He became seriously ill, and so was the horse that he was riding, so ill that he could not, he could no longer go on his way. They were at the village of the Hanasaskis, and so Thomas Wood and his ill horse both stayed at the village hoping to recuperate. 
Fast forward to September 9 through 12, which is when the Batson Fallum expedition was in Totera Town, four days. One of their main native guides became very ill with a fever. And one of their Appomattox guys got really sick. So they decided to hire one of the Toteras as a replacement guide. This indicates very clearly that the, this group of explorers moving westward were carrying with them a number of contagions that were being introduced into this region. And then on September 21st, they left Totera town and returned to the Hanasaskis where they found that Thomas Wood had died and was buried and likewise, likewise with his horse. So this is pretty strong evidence that they had introduced contagions into the Western part of the state. So big changes were gonna come and take place. These changes were probably due to the introduction of disease, uh, coupled with raids, continued raids by the Iroquois and the continued encroachment of European colonists. All of this forced the Totoro Indians to make quick, big decisions. As you could probably imagine, if you have a very sustainable population, a group of people you're living with, and then all of a sudden this mystery illness comes about and they all start dying, the foundations of your belief system become shaken. Your traditions become shaken and you look for a, an escape route. And the escape route that was taken by the Toteras were to move. Now, many of the Toteras who did not lose their life from the contagions split up. Some of these people joined with other groups that they knew about. The majority of them headed south along the Yadkin River where they took up a place and established a village. John Lawson in 1700 said that the Doteras, the Saponis, and the Kiowas, all living on the upper uh, uh, Yadkin River, planned to move together and join some other groups to increase their numbers as a way of strengthening themselves. They also positioned themselves south, moving away from the Iroquois who were based up in New York and Pennsylvania. And they were a little bit closer to the Tuscaroras. Um, these are Native American speaking an Iroquoian language in Eastern North Carolina, but they were on kind of friendly terms with all the interior Indians. So this is a big change. In 29 years from the time Batson Fallon entered into the Roanoke Valley until 1700, the Totera lost a lot of members of their group. Their culture system was on shaky ground and they vacated the Roanoke Valley and headed for safer places. These changes were going to continue throughout the 1700s. And the changes really were like this. So the, in 1700s, the Totero and, and, and were, were joined with other native groups in North Carolina, but then they began to form a stronger relationship with the Iroquois. This is right during the American Revolution. So there were a lot of changing allegiances because of the American Revolution. So the, 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 the Totero and their allies began moving northward. They went up to central Pennsylvania, the Susquehanna River Valley, stayed there in about the uh, 1750s for a while, and then eventually decided to head northward where they joined the Iroquois nation in the six groups of Iroquois in, in, uh, in, 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 North, in, in New York, excuse me. And there the, the Tutelo and their, and their friends established a very close relationship with the Cayuga Indians. 
This is interesting because the Cayuga were one of the enemies that used to come down and raid the Toteros. So the Cayuga accept the Totero and their friends um, and they can establish their own town immediately south of the Cayuga town. And there the, the, the Indians lived uh, in some harmony during the revolution until 1779, when the Cayuga town became one of 40 Iroquois towns that was attacked and destroyed by Colonel Dearborn's American forces. So all of, the, all of a sudden, 40 Iroquois towns were decimated and the Totera and remaining Cayuga decided to go into a reservation that was quickly established by the English crown. Um, and they were led by Joseph Brandt. His, his um, portrait is in the left-hand side of the screen. He was a very powerful and influential Mohawk leader. He was a military leader, political leader, and social leader. And he was instrumental in the formation of the Six Nations of the Grand River Reservation in Canada. So this is where the Totero people entered. At that time, there were just under 2,000 Iroquoian people. The Iroquois consist of a league of a group of, of native of tribes, uh, and they are under in a form of a confederacy or alliance, which they called the Hanudusani. So they were they referred to themselves as the six Hanudusani nations. So they were the Mohawk, the Onondaga, Cayuga, Oneida, Seneca, and Tuscarora, all names that we are fairly familiar with. Plus, they were joined by about 400 Nanakoke, Totero, and some other people, maybe Cherokee and Creek members. So they were all on this reservation in 1784. Now this is a picture of six of the Iroquois chiefs. Picture was taken September 14th, 1871. So this picture would have been taken 150 years ago next Tuesday. And it shows these six, treats, these six chiefs uh, displaying and explaining their wampum belts. And I show you this picture because it was taken by a man named Horatio Hill. Horatio Hill lived in New York at one time, and he is best known for his study of the Iroquois language. Uh, in about the 1660s or early 1670s, he moved from New York into Canada on some family business. But when he was in Canada, he was really taken by the Six Rivers Cayuga, or the Six Rivers, uh, the Six Nations Grand River Reservation. There's where he saw the, the Iroquois again. And he went in there and began spending time with them. He also said that by, by the 16, 50s, the, the Tutelo Nation had really ceased to, for, to exist. So that's the Totera Nation. And he said that a contagion of 1832 and 1848 swept through the reservation and the populations just plummeted. Horatio Hell is, is, is an important figure and we're gonna talk about him a little bit more. He's on the left here. And on the right is Nokonha. And these two formed a relationship together. Uh, Horatio Hell had a great interest in the Iroquois. As I said before, he studied their language. He was pretty much a linguist at that time. But he went on to the reservation and he encountered a group of people he was not familiar with. And Nokona was the last full blood Totera to live on this planet. So he met Horatio Hell when he was 106 years old. This was in 1870. And they collaborated together. They developed the friendship. And Nakona would provide words 
and sentence fragments. For most of his life, uh, you know, he was born and raised as a Totero, but for a good part of his life, he lived with a Cayuga and he married a Cayuga woman. He lived in a Cayuga household and he spoke the Cayuga language. But even at his elderly age, he remembered much of his native tongue, which he communicated to Horatio Hell. And Horatio Hell was just fascinated with all this. And he really liked his close relationship with Nakona. It was indeed wonderful that these two people met. So no, Horatio Hell collected his information, and this was in the fall of 1870. And during the winter months, he analyzed the linguistic information he had, and, and then he had plans to return. But in the following February, Nakona, uh, Nakona had, had passed away. Nonetheless, Horatio Hale, a little bit dismayed to lose his friend and his main informant, went back to the reservation and met with some other Totero who were half-bloods. They were, you know, part Totero part uh, Cayuga. They were basically assimilated into Cayuga society, but they remembered bits and pieces of their ancestry that were conveyed to them by their by their elders, and they provided that information to to uh, to Horatio Hell. It wasn't much, but Horatio Tell Hell took the information he could. And he wrote a, a long essay called The Tutelo Tribe and Language that was introduced to the American Philosophical Society and published in 1883. And the legacy of these two individuals is that they established that the Totero people were speaking an Eastern Siouan language, as were their friends, the Okanichi and and uh, and Saponi and Monacans and Manahoics, they were they were all practicing an Eastern Siouan language, which really was related distantly to the Siouan languages of the Sioux people we are familiar with on the Western Plains of the United States, suggesting that these two groups go back in history to become one. <clears throat> and they are also remembered because <clears throat> they recognized the Totero as speakers, and they were then, I guess, I don't know, it's, it's, it's the thing about Horatio Hill that I really don't like, it's part of his legacy, is that he changed the name of the Totero Indians to the Tutelo Indians, and that is in his essay. In his 1883 essay, here it is. He says the Toteros, whom we shall henceforth, henceforth known, know as the Tutelos. And that's a big statement. And I don't like it. It's basically because of the language he reconstructed from the 100 or so words and sentence fragments he collected from Nakona and some of the other descendants of the Totero. <clears throat> and he used that word tutelo, which to the best, <clears throat> excuse me, the best of our understanding and, and from his text, he suggests that that is a word that was used by the Iroquois people to refer to the group of Southern Indians that migrated, immigrated northward and joined the Iroquois. So it's really an Iroquois term for all these, a group of Southern Indians. I don't really agree with it. <clears throat> I like this other quote by James Mooney, who is a very noted ethno-historian and archeologist written just what, 11 years after Horatio Hell. And he basically says, well, you know, after these people moved to the Iroquois country, became accepted with the Iroquois, and Horatio Hale decided to refer to them as Tutelo, and that word's become a more prominent 
we're accepting it in deference to Horatio Hell in respect to him. Um, and he even admits that Totero is more in agreement with old authorities. And it's true, if you look at the colonial documents, if you see a mention of these people, it is, they are identified as Totero, never Tutelo. So that's probably an unfortunate thing, but the word Totero was accepted by, by academia, by, by the scholars, and it was also accepted by the Native American groups, and they use it today. So I don't really see any way of escaping this. So, you know, that's sort of a, a quick history of the Tutelo, where from the time they encountered Bats and Fallon, they their lives began to change immeasurably. And they moved to South Carolina, joined with other groups, saw many of their people die, saw their cultural system collapse. They became taken in by the Cayuga. And then during the Revolutionary War, they were forced into taking up residency in, a, in, in Canada, where the end of their, their culture came about and the last full-blooded Indian died. <clears throat> and it, it's, it's a sad thing. I think the other native groups in Virginia here had very similar histories, but perhaps we won't know them as great. But one of the things about some of the other groups is they were somewhat more resilient. Instead of taking off and going to other places, like joining the Iroquois and moving to New York and in Canada, they went underground, they hid into the mountains. And many of these people continued to live pretty much under the radar of the European Americans. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that the, with the British uh, and the English colony and Americans were really busy fighting each other during the Revolutionary War. So today, of all of the native groups we find today, there are some people who still exist as organized, very viable cultural groups. Uh, the Monacan Indian Nation is recognized uh, by the Commonwealth of Virginia and by the United States of America as a sovereign nation. They are based in Amherst County, which is their ancestral territory. The Okanichi Band of the Saponi Indian and then the Saponi Nation and the Halawa Saponi Tribe are all groups of people uh, that they fall under the name Saponi, but they also include Okanichi and, and, um, and some of the other groups such as Charwa and Eno. And these groups are headquartered right at the Virginia state border, but in North Carolina. Um, many of the people living on both sides of the border share the ancestry of all of these people. They are the ancestors of the group of Native Americans who lived in central Virginia and into the Blue Ridge of Virginia in the 1700s. They were all interconnected politically and socially perhaps in a form of confederacy. Uh, these people were intermarried and they relied upon each other and they had a lot of shared histories. So these people today are still around and the Monacan are the northernmost star here. Um, and we see from left to right near the border with North Carolina, the Ukinichi band of the, of the Saponi and then the Saponi nation and the Halawa Saponi tribe. That word Halawa is a created word. It's uh, taken from the two counties in North Carolina where, where most of the tribal members live. That's Halifax County and Warren County. But I should also say that many of the tribal members also live in Halifax County, Virginia and Charlotte County, Virginia, just to the east of here, about an hour's drive. So, um, Many of these people have a shared history of the Monacan, and I would encourage you to learn more about these people and remember 
what happened to them from 18 or from 1671 through the present. Um, you can go to their websites. You can learn more about these people, their history, their lives today, and how they're building a future for their descendants. There's a lot of really fascinating information there. Regarding the Tutelo, after Horatio Hale and, and all of his work, and you know, he mentions the collapse of the Tutelo Nation by, you know, by 1850, uh, another linguist, Edward Sapir, um, decided to try to fulfill some of the early work of, of Horatio Hale, and he went up to the, up to the uh, reservation in Canada in the early 1900s and was really disappointed to find that most of the descendants of the Tutelo at that point knew very little of their of their Tutelo tradition and even of their language. So there really wasn't enough information to even build upon what was learned by Horatio Hill. So that brings about the end of this talk. Um, I hope it encouraged you to learn more about these people. Uh, uh, when things change, you may want to part, uh, you may want to attend one of the Monacan annual powwows. Those are really fascinating events. You can treat it as a festival. You can treat it as an excellent learning experience, or you can treat it as a little bit of both. But going there, you'll enjoy yourself and you really will, will learn a lot about Native history and the history of these people today. So thank you very much. Oh, gracious, Tom. Wonderful information. Absolutely wonderful information. Uh, 